but we're still kind of building our foundation of what are the basic processes that cells do that are at the core of all of the other things that we usually think of the body doing that ultimately are coming down to, again, 10 trillion cells all somehow coordinating with each other and doing their, doing their magic together. So, um, might as well just start with our warm up quiz. Um, again, like I will mention again, these are for me and for you. Like if you are doing the warm up quizzes and you're finding your scores are down low, like our first major exam is a week from today. There's not a lot of time to really get up to speed on stuff if you're still struggling with things. So make sure you use this as a um, you know kind of data point of like, oh, I gotta get this stuff more solid. Um, it's because you know right now there's still time to study. There's still time to ask questions, still time to go to tutoring, still time to do lots of stuff. Um, so all righty. Let's see. This Professor, one. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I don't think we ever had someone come and present about the tutoring, right? Do we just have to look on the comm website for whenever they offer it? Because I thought we were going to have someone come and speak about it. We did have someone come and speak about it. Right. Yeah, Chris did. He came and spoke. He was like speaking for like 15 minutes. Yeah, he did. Oh, okay, I think I'm confusing this with my anatomy class because I remember anatomy, no one shut up. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, we, we, we did. And, you know, you still need to go on the website right, okay. to see what the actual timing is. But yeah, no, Chris. Okay, Chris, yeah, I'm just confusing this anatomy. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So most people got this exogenous ligand that binds and blocks the receptor that would be an antagonist. If it binds and activates it, what would that be? You know, an agonist? An agonist. So again, in a lot of pharmaceuticals work by being one or the other. You know, beta blockers that are trying to keep your heart rate down, to keep your blood pressure down. Those are adrenergic antagonists, things that block adrenaline receptors things that are trying to open up your bronchial passages when you're having an asthma attack would be an adrenergic agonist, something that activates adrenaline receptors to open up, dilate your bronchial passages. Um, and again, there's lots of different drugs that work by either being agonists or antagonists. And like I mentioned, there's also kind of things in between partial agonists and things like that. Um, Which of the following cell-to-cell -cell attachments electrically connects cells? Again, most people got this gap junctions. Those are the ones that open up the little tunnels between one cell to the other so ions can flow. Um, desmosomes are about just physically attaching them so they can't pull apart, like you've in your skin, in your cardiac muscle cells. Tight junctions were the things that were like the Ziploc, like we saw in the epithelium where we had the transepithelial transport. You needed tight junctions. The things couldn't just kind of wiggle between the cells and kind of sneak around the system. So that's uh, that. Um, then we've got drugs like caffeine, morphine, LSD, THC, you know, this all sounds like a lot of fun, right? Uh, beta blockers, albuterol, act as exogenous ligands. So this one, I was a little, you know, still we got 90% of the people got this, but if you were one of the people who didn't. Oh, uh, we can't see your screen. It's showing something else, I think. Oh, oh I see what happened. All right, thank you. Um, so when we have things that act as an exogenous ligand, that means it's coming in 
it's binding the receptor that's on the membrane, but the, you know, and affecting the cell behavior. So any of these things, caffeine comes in, it's a antagonist to adenosine receptors in your neurons. Adenosine receptors, usually as the adenosine builds up, that's a sign in your brain that you know, you're getting sleepier. But if you block those receptors, then you feel a little more awake. That's how caffeine perks you up. Caffeine works by being an antagonist to an adenosine receptor in your neurons in your brain. Um, binding receptors in affecting cell behavior. Um, they don't disrupt the cell membrane. Um, there are things that can affect you by getting into the membrane. Some anesthetics, it seems, might actually work by getting into the membrane and just affecting membrane dynamics. So it's, it's not completely crazy that things can get in the membrane and affect the dynamics of channels and things. But when we talk about exogenous ligands, that's not what we're talking about. Um, so let's see. Choose all that are true regarding secondary active transport. And again, remember the whole process, transepithelial transport, which we saw, which I kind of put this into context, is something that I, I promise you'll see next Tuesday on your exam. So you want to make sure you understand this, you know, kind of well. You know, does not use ATP, good. Uses energy stored in the concentration gradient. Yes. It is not a passive transport because it's active. Um, requires specialized membrane proteins, indeed. Remember that was, it was necessary to have that co-transporter that coupled the movement of the sodium back in with the glucose in the example that we gave specifically. Um, it can be used molecule, move molecules from low to high concentration. You know, that's what makes it active transport. You're using the energy stored in this concentration gradient to move something else against its concentration gradient. Like when we think about active versus passive transport, that's one of the big differences. Passive is always from high to low concentration, whereas active transport can push things against their concentration gradient. So give at least four different roles played by proteins embedded. Um, this, you know, a lot of people got this, but you know, when I asked for a question like this, some people would, you know, four different roles, it's like channels and carriers and antiports and symports. It's like, those are all kind of the same role. Those are all just transporting things across the membrane. You know, we talked much more broadly, there's transport proteins and receptors and cell identification, and they can be enzymes and cell-to-cell -cell attachment and cytoskeletal attachment points. You know, so, you know, people who gave me like four different examples of the same basic role, you know, you only get kind of credit for one part of it. Some people just gave me three things, even though it asked for four. You know, I would say just as a kind of test taking strategy as we're going into the main exam coming up, you always want to kind of read the question after you're done answering it. And then like, did I answer it? Like, it's like, okay, let me read this again. Give at least four. It's like, oh, wait a second. I only got three. Let me put another one down here. So you always kind of want to go back and double check that you've answered the question. Um, so any questions about any of those? No. Okie dokie. So what we are going to do now is shift gears. And we are going to be talking about cellular respiration. And we'll be looking at it at a deeper level than you've looked at it in like bio 110. If you, you know, you've all seen cellular respiration. Um, not as deep as you would look into it in a biochemistry class. So I'll kind of give you a sense of how deep you need to know. 
this basic idea is going to be important. This idea of potential energy, which we've talked a bunch about, but I want to just kind of remind you about the idea of potential energy. And this is here in this picture of something that you have intuition about. You have this intuition. If you use energy and push this big ball up to the top of the ramp, now it's there, it's just sitting there, but it's got stored energy. And if you let it go, you can convert that stored energy here with respect to gravity and do something here. It's rolling down the hill and knocking somebody over or something, right? So this idea of potential energy, again, what are the ways we store potential energy in the cells that we've talked about? Chemical bonds. Yeah, totally, and chemical bonds. We're gonna be starting, in fact, the whole thing of cellular respiration is starting with the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of a glucose molecule. That's gonna be the start of it all. You know, we're gonna end with the potential energy stored in a more usable form in the chemical bonds of an ATP molecule or a bunch of ATP molecules. You know, and then what are other ways? And actually there's also the chemical um, bonds of the electron carriers. I've talked about like NADH. NADH is gonna be a major player in our, in our story. So there's gonna be a number of molecules that are storing potential energy in their chemical bonds that can be released as they go through chemical reactions and reconfigure their chemical bonds and electrons. Where else have we talked about potential energy being stored? Just a few seconds ago, actually. Electro we electrolytes, uh, mechanical. So there's mechanical, there was electrical potential, and there's one other one that's used like to run secondary active transport, for instance. Um, concentration gradient. Yeah, exactly, concentration gradient. So that's gonna be important in our discussion today as well. Um, along the way of creating ATP, the energy that was originally in the glucose molecule is going to be stored in a proton concentration gradient in the mitochondria. So you'll we'll see that. So just be aware of that. And let's go, let me go back to So what is the basic chemical reaction that is the one that will describe cellular respiration? Metabolism? No, metabolism is the sum total of all the chemical reactions going on. Cellular respiration is referring to a very specific, specific one. Glucose plus water makes um, CO2 and ATP. Exactly. C6H12O6, that's glucose, plus some oxygen becomes water plus CO2, you know, plus, you know, the energy. And like I said, very beginning of the semester. The energy, if you were just lighting the sugar on fire, it would just be the combustion of glucose. The energy would be released as heat and light. But instead, we're going to have somewhere around, I'm going to say around 36 ATP are going to be ultimately what we are making out of this whole thing. The energy that was originally stored in the bonds of the glucose are going to end up being stored in the bonds of the ATP. And ATP, as we know, is gonna be a really easy way to deliver energy to different cellular processes. So, do people know about Rube Goldberg devices? So he was famous, he was like this guy who'd make these cartoons about these crazy machines, so to speak, that did you know pretty simple things. So, Whenever I think of, you know, this is cellular respiration here. 
it's pretty straightforward when you look at it this way. When you look at it happening in the cell, it's anything but straightforward. Um, so here, I'll share, I'll share this with you just to kind of, you know, this is this thing here, which is designed to basically after he takes a little, you know, a spoon of his soup, it wipes his mouth with a napkin. And, you know, the way it works is it's, it's going to start with, um, you know, he takes the soup and brings it to his mouth. Um, that pulls on the string. The string then yanks on the spoon, throws a cracker up into the air. Then this parrot flies up to eat the cracker. And as he flies off of this lever, then the weight of this thing goes down and the sand goes into the bucket. As the bucket fills with sand, it's going to pull on the string. And as it pulls on that string, it's going to light the lighter. And as the lighter goes off, it lights this little rocket. And as the rocket flies off, it pulls on this little razor that cuts the string. And as the string is cut, then this pendulum can swing, which is attached to the napkin, which is wiping his mouth. Um, so when I think of cellular respiration, this, this, this image always comes to my mind. So just to kind of, kind of preparing you that the process of going from glucose to 36 ATP is going to take us like the next hour or so to kind of discuss because it's lots of little things happening. And ultimately, when we do the final accounting, we're going to end up with six water, six carbon dioxide, and 36 ATP after we broke down one glucose. But it's not going to be that straightforward. So let's get into it. All right, so let me get my little keyboard here so I can. So again. Oh, duh, there it is. So cellular respiration. And like I said, at the core, there's a glucose. We're gonna need oxygen to make this go. And we're gonna end up with carbon dioxide plus water plus a bunch of ATP. Um, okay, there we go. So we're gonna start with the sugar. It turns out we're not even going to need the oxygen for the first steps. The first parts of this are what we often call the anaerobic respiration. Um, and it's going to actually be important. Um, some cells don't even use the, this whole pathway. Um, so let's, we're going to start with what's called glycolysis. So glycolysis, glyco, sugar, lysis, break apart. So this occurs in the cytosol. Right? Usually you think of cellular respiration and making ATP happening in the mitochondria. That's where we're going to do like the really hardcore machinery to make lots of ATP. But the first steps actually happen just with enzymes floating around in the cytosol. 
So this is not in the mitochondria yet, it, just in the cytosol. Um, doesn't need oxygen. Um, so sometimes this is called like anaerobic respiration. Um, it can also be called fermentation. Um, it's the same basic way that um, your yeasts are turning like grape juice into wine. Um, is the same basic process here, right? Like if you're trying to make wine or beer, basically you're taking, the yeast are taking sugar and metabolizing it, you know, and getting their energy. And then in the by, byproduct of that is alcohol, which is nice in your beer and wine. So obviously glycolysis is gonna start with sugar. So there's our glucose. Um, the first step of this, I actually mentioned, I think at the beginning of the semester when I was describing metabolic pathways. It was gonna be this phosphorylated glucose. You know, and there's going to be some enzyme, some like hexokinase. Right, a kinase is just something that phosphorylates things. Hexokinase or glucokinase, they can be called as well. Phosphorylates a hexose sugar, a six carbon sugar. Um, one of the nice things about this first step is glucose can make it through the carrier to get into the cell, but phosphorylated glucose can't go through the carrier, so it's trapped. It means it's not gonna accidentally leave the cell, right? So it's trapped and it's gonna stick around for the next steps here. Um, and then there are basically 10 steps. Um, I don't, you're not responsible for knowing all of the 10 steps of glycolysis. So again, we're talking about glycolysis here. What you do need to know are the end products. When you get to the end of these 10 steps, the end of glycolysis, we have made two net ATP. So notice I'm saying net. You know, because if we think about this, if we're going to phosphorylate a glucose, where did we probably get the, AT, the, the phosphate group to phosphorylate the glucose? ATP? Yeah, totally. So we actually had to use an ATP up to start this whole process to phosphorylate the glucose. Um, in along the way, you use up two ATP, but you make four ATP. So by the time we're done with the whole thing, we have two more ATP than we started with. So just doing this anaerobic respiration, you do get energy, but not very much compared to how many is possible, right? Obviously, this is like one eighteenth the amount of like energy output that is possible if you run this cellular respiration through the um, complete pathways available in the mitochondria. But you get ATP and for some cases we're gonna see that's enough. It's gonna be enough um, for like RBCs floating around. It's gonna be actually used in anaerobic respiration in your fast twitch muscles, we'll see just doing this, because it happens pretty fast. Um, we're also gonna have potential energy stored in NADH. So if you remember NADH, we're the high energy electron carriers. 
So when you see NADH, you think about these, it's kind of like the ball up at the top of the ramp, right? They've got a lot of energy right now and they can do something with it if they've got the appropriate situation. And we're gonna also have two pyruvate. So these are little three carbon um, organic molecules. Basically we had a six carbon glucose turning into two of these three carbon pyruvates, which actually still has a lot of energy stored in its bonds as well, or their bonds, I should say. So at this point, just to kind of think about potential energy, we've got some of the energy that was originally in the glucose is now stored in these ATP, which is the stuff that we can actually use directly. And then there is actually energy stored in the NADH, but that has to be like extracted in a more complicated um, system. And there is actually quite a bit of energy still stored in these pyruvates, but again, it's gonna take more complicated machinery to extract that energy. So, Assuming that we do not have the mitochondria or we don't have oxygen, because the oxygen is going to be necessary in the mitochondria, it is possible just to stop here. So you can stop here. Basically, the pyruvates will accept those electrons from the NADHs. Um, it creates lactic acid. So we've kind of basically burned away. The energy that was potential in here is thrown away. But we still have this ATP, which is useful. Um, this lactic acid eventually gets taken to the liver and, um, and kind of dealt with converted into other stuff. Um, so this is anaerobic respiration or just kind of pure glycolysis. And again, we will come back to it. We'll come back to it, particularly when we get into muscle metabolism. Because um, it's relatively simple. You know, this does not look like a Rube Goldberg apparatus yet. This is just like 10 direct steps along a metabolic pathway. Turns out it's you know, way faster to make ATP, even if it's super inefficient, if you just do glycolysis, then wait for the mitochondria to do all of their complicated stuff. So we'll come back to this. And again, lactic acid is in our cells. Other cells, non-humans, do a similar thing, but instead, you know, other organisms, make ethanol instead of lactic acid. Again, that's you know this idea of fermentation. Um, that's how you make beer or wine. You just have sugar and you let the yeast do their glycolysis and they're making ATP for their cellular activities, which they don't need that much. This is plenty. If you're a little yeast thing floating around, that's all you need. Um, and they're making ethanol, which is what makes your wine and beer alcoholic. Eventually, if they're stuck in a carboy, they're gonna make enough alcohol that they actually kill themselves because they'll pickle themselves. That's why you know, wine can't really be above around 12, 15% alcohol because the yeast will die in there. If you wanna make something a little with more of a kick, you've gotta distill it then and concentrate the alcohol. Um, but yeah, so this is, any questions about just the basic glycolysis? Again, happening in the cytosol, all of the enzymes necessary to make this run are in just floating around in the cytosol. Anaerobic, it doesn't need oxygen for any of this. You're making a little bit of ATP and these other things that have potential energy, but is being wasted. 
if you're just going in through this fermentation, making lactic acid. So if we do have oxygen, we are gonna get into a more complicated system in the mitochondria. So let's go there now. If O2, continues in the mitochondrion. All right, so let's um, talk about mitochondria a little bit. So, I'll, so if you have a cell, the mitochondria are actually double membraned. There's this whole endosymbiont hypothesis for mitochondria, as well as for chloroplasts and even the nucleus. This idea that way back in the past, there was some cell that ate some little bacteria, but then realized that this little thing had processes that was useful to make energy for the bigger cell. So this thing continued living in here as kind of a endosymbiont, a sim endo within symbi you know, mutual symbiosis. So this, this system here, it's kind of weird. There's a lot of evidence that the mitochondrion originally came from some other kind of organism. The um, codons, the um, number the three nucleotide bases that code for one amino acid or another amino acid, they're different in a mitochondrion than in your main DNA code for your cell, like in your, nucle in your nucleus, you've got all your DNA and your codons for what's an alanine, what's a cytosine, what's a cysteine. The codons in the mitochondria are actually different. Um, so it's pretty clear they were some other creature that got taken up, but then kind of integrated as this thing that is now part of your cell making energy for you. Um, other interesting things about mitochondria is they, you know, they, 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 they reproduce in here and create new mitochondria. But when you are making eggs and sperm, you know, the sperm are basically just DNA getting delivered with a little swimming tail. And then the egg has all the organelles in it. It has DNA, but it has also mitochondria, et cetera. You know, so all of your, all of your mitochondria are descended from, as well as all your organelles are descending from your mom. And so people can actually track matrilineal descent through mitochondrial DNA because mitochondria have their own DNA and you can actually, and it, it's only from the um, kind of maternal lines that you've descended from. It has nothing to do with the, any of the sperm that were involved in you becoming into existence. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's a cool tool for kind of looking at, at that. Um, what else about mitochondria? Double membrane, again, because of this idea, endosymbiont, it had its own membrane and then it got endocytose. So now there's two membranes. Um, the inner part we call the matrix. So the matrix is the part inside. Then there's this intramembrane space, which is gonna be important. And it'll be diff there'll be different things going on, whether or not we're looking in this, if we're looking in this intramembrane space, we're gonna have different stuff happening than inside this mitochondrial matrix. So what we're gonna do now is look at this mitochondrion in more detail. So this is now my mitochondrion.
Wow. So here's my little inner inner membrane. Outer membrane. Right, this is just the cytosol here. Here's my matrix. Right, maybe I should do some color stuff in here. So here's that intramembrane space I was talking about, right? So is every, everybody's kind of oriented here? All right, so in the matrix, we are gonna bring in those two molecules that still had energy that we need to extract. So if you remember when we were done with cellular respiration, we still had you know, the NADH, and we had the pyruvates. So we are gonna bring them into the mitochondrion where we're gonna be able to extract the potential energy that's still stored in these molecules. And let's watch it happen. So the first thing is pyruvate gets converted into um, a two carbon molecule called acetyl-CoA. Um, so acetyl-CoA, a two-carbon molecule, just to kind of give you a sense of the ultimate accounting that we're going to be doing to actually make sense of the original formula for the combustion of glucose, let me just bring it in right now even. Um, so remember C... C6H12O6 plus six oxygen becomes six H2O plus six CO2s plus 36 ATP. So this step right here, where we're going from this three carbon pyruvate to a two carbon acetyl CoA, we obviously are losing a carbon, right? So, so part of this process is actually creating a carbon dioxide. So how many carbon dioxides are gonna be made from a single glucose at, just from this one step? Two. Two, exactly. There's two pyruvates coming in from each glucose. So if we go to our overall accounting here, all right, we now have two out of six carbon dioxides accounted for. None of the waters, we have two of the ATP are accounted for because we made two originally in glycolysis. So we've got two ATP is accounted for. Obviously, the glucose is breaking down. We haven't dealt with any oxygen yet or any water, and we still have four carbon dioxide and 34 ATP to deal with before we have actually had you know this equation describe what happens. So we're going to continue. Acetyl CoA is gonna feed into this thing called the Krebs cycle. So, so let me try to draw, draw this better. Hold on, I drew this pretty bad.
Okay. Let me try to make this make more sense here. So each of the things I just colored in blue are molecules or intermediates along the way in cellular respiration. So this thing here, this Krebs cycle, it's called the Krebs cycle because it kind of goes in this circle. Um, whoops, hold on, let me draw this better. Krebs cycle, it's also called the citric acid cycle, also called the TCA cycle. Basically, this, what we think of as kind of this intermediate here, this eighth intermediate in this, in this kind of wheel, oxaloacetate, combines with the acetyl-CoA to become citric acid. That's why this is also called the citric acid cycle. TCA, tricarboxylic acid cycle, because citric acid is just like three carboxyls together. So acetyl-CoA joins oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate, this is a four carbon. Let me, let me draw this less, four carbon. So this four carbon oxaloacetate joins with this two carbon acetyl-CoA to become this six carbon citric acid. Citric acid, and you don't need, if you were in a major's biology class or you were in a biochemistry class, you would have to know each of the intermediates by name and you would need to know the enzymes moving you from one to the next. For our class, you don't. For our class, what you just need to know is acetyl-CoA enters into this, this little circular metabolic pathway that's eating its own tail. Acetyl-CoA combines with this four carbon intermediate to become this citric acid, which becomes something else, becomes eight different steps. After eight steps, we're back at oxaloacetate, this four carbon thing, which is then going to join with the next acetyl-CoA waiting in the wings to go around the wheel again. And after we've gone around the wheel, we've created another oxaloacetate, which is ready to go with the next acetyl-CoA, which is waiting in the wings to run around the, this thing. So thinking about the accounting again, if we have a six carbon, six carbon citric acid, and by the time we're at, at done with these eight steps, there's a four carbon oxaloacetate, that means we've lost two more carbons for each spin. So each of those carbons is gonna be part of another CO2. So as we've gone around this thing, once we've made two carbon dioxides, and again, how many spins of this cycle do we get from an, an, each glucose? How many acetyl-CoA's are we getting from each glucose? Two. Two, exactly. Remember you got two pyruvates, each pyruvate becomes an acetyl-CoA. So we get to kick this around twice, which means in each time we kick it around, we lose two carbons. So why looky there? One, two, three, four. Okay, we have now accounted for all the carbon dioxides in this thing because two spins of the Krebs cycle gives us four more carbon dioxides. We got two carbon dioxides from converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA. So 
this is why I was saying, I was saying this is ultimately going to describe the equation. This equation is going to describe things, but it's not going to be in a straightforward manner. We still haven't dealt with the oxygen or the water or most of the ATP. So let's continue. Um, obviously, we wouldn't do the Krebs cycle if all it was doing was making waste. So in addition, so each spin of the Krebs cycle, it's also making molecules that have got energy. So it makes ATP, not a lot. It makes one ATP. Um, and it also makes three NADHs and one FADH2. Um, for our purposes, it does, don't, don't worry about the difference between FAD and NAD. Both of these are just high energy electron carriers. You know, each, let me write this. Each carry two high energy electrons. So when you see NADH or you see FADH2, you basically think about two electrons that are up at the top of that ramp, ready to fall down and do something, right? So this ATP, that's, that's done. So, and actually we talked about, we get two spins for the original glucose. So if we go back to our, our original accounting here, we've got two more ATP because we spun around the Krebs cycle twice from the original glucose. We're still missing the majority of the ATP. So at this point, if we think about the original energy that was in that glucose. Remember, we started with a glucose, which ended up being pyruvate, you know, NADH, and ATP out here. This was like the original glycolysis, and then the pyruvate and the NAD came in. So now, of the original energy stored in that glucose molecule, we've made four ATPs, but most of it is stored in these high energy electrons and the NADHs, the ones we brought in from here and the ones we're making in the Krebs cycle. So most of the energy that was originally in the glucose is still locked away in these electron carriers and not in a useful form. So now we need a way to get that energy. And that is gonna happen in what's called the electron transport system. There are these special membrane proteins located within the inner membrane here. So these things that I've just drawn here, these are called cytochromes. and they make what's called the electron transport chain or electron transport system. Uh, maybe, let me draw it. AKA also known as, you know, electron, not elect, electron transport system. And, and again, it's made out of these cytochromes, which are these special membrane proteins.
So these cytochromes are things that can accept electrons. So that get NADH. comes in, it sends two electrons into the electron transport system or electron transport chain. And then it is now NADH, I mean, NAD plus plus H plus. So this NAD comes in and it donates its two high energy electrons into this electron transport chain. And again, if again, using that kind of analogy of the ramp, you can think about the beginning of the chain as the top of the hill and the bot this last cytochrome as the bottom of the hill. So basically the electrons fall from cytochrome to cytochrome. So this is as you know, as each thing kind of is transferring the electron from one to the other, these oxidation reduction kind of things, right? One thing has the high energy electrons and then the next thing receives them at a slightly lower energy. The next one receives them at a lower energy. Again, this kind of analogy of the ball rolling down the hill, except in this case, it's electrons being um, configured into lower and lower energy configurations as they go from one cytochrome to the next. Um, as that's happening, just like you could put a paddle wheel in a river or whatever, you can capture that energy to do something useful. The cytochromes are going to use the energy of the, you know, quote unquote, falling of electrons to pump protons into that intermembrane space. So this basically pumps protons. It uses the energy of, you know, originally the energy was stored in the high energy electrons of the electron carrier, the NADH. Then it drops them in and as the electrons, you know, quote unquote, fall down the electron transport chain, that energy is now being used to pump protons and create a proton gradient. So this is gonna create proton gradient. All right, we now have way more protein, protein, protons in the intermembrane space than we have inside the cell or it's not the cell, inside the mitochondrion, right? So this, so now, again, if you're thinking about energy, originally the energy was stored in the bonds of a glucose. You know, at this point, we got four ATP, but the majority of the energy now is stored in a concentration gradient of protons. This is where the energy is stored now that was originally in the, in the glucose molecule. It's now stored in this concentration gradient of protons, H pluses. But obviously, what do we want? Where do we want the energy ultimately stored in? ATP. ATP, exactly. So we need to have a way to convert the energy that's stored in that proton gradient into ATPs, which are gonna be the useful thing. So there is a special little membrane protein called an ATP synthase. So that protons can come through and this ATP synthase, let me give myself some room here, basically takes ADP plus phosphate, becomes ATP. So this thing here that I just drew, let me give it a 
a name. I'm kind of running out of space here, aren't I? Um, You know, the name ATP synthase just means something that synthesizes ATP. It's a membrane protein that allows the protons to come back into the matrix along their concentration gradient, but extracts the price, right? It creates, in fact, here. Um, So if you're, I'm, I'm going to show you this ridiculous thing. This is this is so kind of trippy. Um, I don't want to show it to you quite yet because then I'll lose this picture. But basically, this ATP synthase is like a little molecular machine. You know, I can use the analogy of like, oh, the water is coming down the hill and spinning a paddle wheel and milling the grain or something. But if this little thing, this, this is literally a protein that has like a spinning wheel on it. Like as the protons come in, things move and spin and ultimately catalyze the formation of ATP. So, at this point, the energy that was originally in our sugar then was in the electron carriers, then was in the proton gradient, now is finally ATP, which is what we really wanted. And by the time we're done with all of this, and we go back to our original, our original um, accounting here, we now have all the ATP accounted for. So after we've done with all the electron transport chain and then having the protons come back in and convert the energy of the proton gradient into ATP, we have made all the ATP. If you read your books, often they'll talk about, oh, somewhere between 34 to 38 ATP. You, always, you probably wonder, how come it's like kind of wishy-washy? It's because there's kind of disconnects between how efficient this is in different situations. You know, in general, it's around 36 ATP that you can capture, but it's gonna depend on a few different things because it's not a just direct chemical reaction like you're more used to. Um, what is still missing in our accounting? Quick question. Yeah. Uh, are there multiple of these ATP synthase in a mitochondria? Yeah, there's lots of them. Yeah, so there's lots of protons coming back down and making lots of ATP. Um, so what's still missing in our accounting? Water. And? I mean, sorry, oxygen. Yeah, but both. You're right. Water, water, and oxygen. So we still haven't even seen, like, why you need oxygen. So let's go back into our picture. So we need to kind of go back into our electron transport system here. Again, I'm going to give myself a little more room here, erase some stuff. All right, so we had NADH donated its 
pro its electrons into the electron transport chain. And as the electrons moved down, they pumped. But where do those electrons go? Right, those two electrons are now at the last cytochrome. They don't just fall off. Electrons don't just fall off into space. There has to be some final electron acceptor, something with you know, the most electronegativity that can hold on to these things and accept them. Kind of like something that can like take, you know, the ball can fall down onto that's even below the bottom of the ramp. So the ball is now no longer on the ramp and a new ball can go on the ramp. So we need something that is kind of like, what molecule can accept electrons from other things that is kind of the lowest um, kind of position if we're using this analogy of gravity would be like kind of like the basement. Oxygen? Yeah, oxygen. Oxygen, its big thing is it really is good at grabbing electrons from other things and because the electrons even lower energy state once it's down, grabs it's on the oxygen. So these electrons that have made it to the end of the electron transport system, you basically, you're gonna join with an oxygen. So I'm gonna say one half of an O2, which is the same as an oxygen, right? Plus two H pluses, plus two electrons is gonna become what? Actually, let me draw this a little better. So here we have our electron transport system. Our cytochromes. We had NADH, two electrons, and then NAD plus plus H plus over here. The electrons are zipping along. At the far end, basically we have two electrons come off, join with an oxygen, plus two H pluses to become Just oxygen. So I saw Maya. You guys, you use your voice. I don't know how well my mic works, but um, yeah, they make water at the end. They make water, right? H two O, two are two hydrogens and an oxygen, with the appropriate number of electrons to put it all together. This just makes water. That's how, this is why you need oxygen in your body, why you breathe. Like, you know, I remember like, you know, a lot of times you have people in the class where we haven't gone over this and it's like, you know, why do you need to breathe? Because you'll die, but why do you die? Because you need oxygen, but why do you need oxygen? Because you'll die. But why do you need oxygen? It's this, if you don't have oxygen, there's nothing to be the final electron receptor, which means the electrons just back up in here, which means they can't, you can't put more in here, which means you are no longer pumping protons, which means there's no proton gradient, which means you're not making ATP anymore because the protons aren't coming in through the ATP synthase. So this is our little final electron acceptor. Without that, the electron transport chain is gonna back up and it's not gonna be able to function anymore. So th does that make sense? Can't you have a different electron acceptor that's not oxygen if it's anaerobic that goes through those three processes? There are, there are different like kind of the archaea bacteria that, that don't need oxygen, yes. But, you know, any kind of eukaryotic um, cell does this. 
but yeah, no, there are there are um, some of the archaea bacteria that have I think like sulfur. Or they use they use different things as a final electron acceptor. That's some yeah, Mike. You should ask Emily or one of the, ask the micro teacher would be able to talk, tell you more about all that. Sorry, I have one quick question. Could you explain again how half of an oxygen is pretty much the same as an oxygen? Oh no, half of an O two. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Got it. Right, because in the accounting, I, I, you know, because over here, we're talking about 602, but you know, in reality, when we're looking at that, you know, those oxygens combine into a di diatomic molecule. But this is gonna finally account for the oxygen in the water. So now we're finally done. We started with the energy stored in the sugar, we went into glycolysis, we ended up with two ATP and then the pyruvates and the NADH. These we had to take into the mitochondria and do all of that magic to finally make the rest of the ATP. We ended up making the CO2 during the breakdown process and in the final steps of getting the electrons out of the electron transport chain, we're making the water as we're using up oxygen. So in terms of like what you need to know what you're responsible for, you should understand, you know, the basics of glycolysis, where it occurs, what you get from it. You should then know, you know, you should know about anaerobic pathways. If you don't use oxygen, you could just make lactic acid and be done. But then you don't get all that bounty of ATP, you only get two net ATP instead. But then you could take the NADH and the pyruvate where a lot of potential energy is still stored, take them into the mitochondria and then in the mitochondrion, we then have pyruvate gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA feeds into the Krebs cycle where we're making lots more high energy electron carriers. Then we feed, so now the energy that was stored in the sugar was then stored in the pyruvate, then stored in the acetyl-CoA it's now stored in these, ener high ener these electron carriers. Now that energy is being converted through the electron transport chain to energy stored in a proton gradient. And then that energy stored in a proton gradient is then being converted finally into ATPs by using this ATP synthase protein. So, you know, you should get, you should, that should make sense. You know, I don't care. You don't need to memorize the names of the intermediates of the molecules that make up the Krebs cycle, but you should know what the Krebs cycle is and that it is the place where we are dismantling acetyl-CoA's and creating lots of NADHs as well as an ATP. You should know that those NADHs then feed their electrons into the electron transport chain so that energy can be used to pump protons. You should know that the proton gradient is then the essential place where we are converting energy to make ATP. Are you, so that all, that any, are there any questions about all of this? Right. And so you can also see why I gave you that Rube Goldberg thing, because it's just, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and I should also just give you a heads up, even if it makes sense in the moment, sometimes when you walk away for a few moments, it gets confusing again. This is one of the things where you probably are going to go back and look at it a few times before it starts really sticking. Because again, there's lots of moving parts here and the energy keeps getting transferred from one form into another form. So this is the basic way that you can make energy from glucose. Oh, and while we're here, let me now share. Oops. 
this is just like this picture of this membrane protein that is the um, that is the ATP synthase. It really has this thing embedded in the membrane as the protons come in. It actually spins this other part around an axle that then is um, actually, you know, creating, you know, binding ATP, ADP plus phosphate into ATPs. So it's, remember I said proteins are really complicated and how this, this would be this really complicated structure after all the amino acids are all folded into this crazy situation. Um, okay. So, hold on, let me do this again. So you can take glucose. You can undergo cellular respiration. And we make lots of ATP. Obviously, your body can use other molecules to make ATP, make energy. You don't have to just be on a glucose drip to survive. What are other kinds of molecules you can break down to make ATP? Proteins and fats. Exactly. So let's start with more other carbohydrates. If I have starch, then all we need to do is break it apart into individual glucoses and we're set. If I have fats though, fats, we had like glycerol and all of these hydrocarbon tails coming off it. If you wanna break down fat for energy, it turns out you can just nibble away kind of two carbons at a time and these can become acetyl-CoA's. You turn these into acetyl-CoA's and then these can feed into the Krebs cycle. So then we're done. The glycerol is actually part of glycolysis. So then the glycolysis is then going to become pyruvates into acetyl-CoA, into Krebs. So you can see the fat, it's more complicated. It takes more steps, but you can take this fat molecule and you can transform the different parts of it and then feed it into the different stuff we've already described. So Remember I talked about the nice thing about these metabolic pathways, the on-ramps and off-ramps. This would be, you know, you can take this fat, but then you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You basically can dismantle it into parts that just feed into this metabolic pathway we've already described, the, the, the cellular respiration. Um, one thing to be aware of when you're breaking fats down to make ATP, you have these intermediates that are formed called ketone bodies. So when you see these, you know that the body is using fats to make its ATP. So like when we do urinalysis later on in the semester, you know, one of the things you look for in your urine and doing do your, when you're doing your analysis, you look for ketones. And if you see high levels of ketones, you know that this person's body is doing a lot of fat breakdown to make their ATP, you know, which might be a sign that they're fasting or that they're on like some, you know, low carbohydrate um, Atkins diet or something but for whatever reason, their body is putting a lot of breaking down fats to make ATP. So it's, you do need, you should be aware that the presence of ketones is a sign 
that your body is using this metabolic pathway that's breaking down fats to ultimately make ATP. Um, for proteins, remember, Amino acids, um, if you're breaking down amino acids, the first thing you need to do is deaminate. So you take this nitrogen group off here, but then this becomes ammonia. So you don't wanna have ammonia floating around in your body. So these, you get two of these and they're get converted into urea. So urea is not reactive. Urea is something that's kind of floating around in your bloodstream and then is excreted by your kidneys. Obviously it can get toxic if it's building up too high, if you're in kidney failure or something. But typically this urea is formed as you break down proteins you deaminate the proteins, you take the amine group off, and then you convert it, and again, just two of these becomes one urea, which is gonna just be something that can float around until you um, excrete it. You know, so that's, you know, that's this formation of urea. Urea is when you're breaking down your proteins here, at least that's what part of it. You know, and then the rest, it really depends on which amino acid you're looking at. You know, depending on which amino acid, the it's going to be broken down. It's going to feed into the um, the uh, metabolic pathway for making ATP in different ways. Because right, there's a huge array of different side chains you find on different amino acids. But the you know the take home message when you're breaking down proteins for amino for energy you're gonna be creating urea because the first step, no matter what else happens next, is to get rid of that amine group. Um, what else do I wanna say about this? Um, any other quest, any questions about, I, I, took, I took longer than I was hoping, but I also know that I don't want to go too fast on this stuff because there's a lot to it and it's confusing. Um, so are there questions about cellular respiration or ultimately, you know, starting with glycolysis and then the full cellular respiration with oxygen. And this, again, sometimes they call this anaerobic respiration. This is like aerobic respiration. Aerobic, anaerobic, with or without oxygen. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh-huh. So you were talking about the electron transport chain and you mentioned um, cytochromes. I was a little confused on what they did. The cytochromes are those specialized membrane proteins that make up that electron transport chain. They are the things that are handing off the electrons from one to another and pumping the protons. So the cytochrome is the official name for those fancy membrane proteins. And they've got metal atoms in them as well. They're more than just proteins. So it's just the, the special name for those, those those things that make up the electron transport chain. Um, I can also mention gluconeogenesis. So you know, I've just mentioned, oh, you can burn fats or proteins and make ATP. Um, it turns out there's one place where you need to use glucose. Um, your central nervous system needs glucose 
for energy. Um, and if you don't have glucose in your diet because you're fasting or you're on the Atkins diet or whatever, your body makes its own glucose to make sure that your brain cells have the glucose they need. So gluconeogenesis, this is base. it means sugar new creation. It's creating new sugar molecules. This is basically glycolysis in reverse. This is basically taking stuff you already have and running it back, running glycolysis backwards to make glucose. Um, most of the enzymes are actually the exact same enzymes because right reactions run one way or the direct one or the other direction based upon the amount of reactants and products. There's a few differences, but it's so I'm going to say basically basically glycolysis in reverse. It's not exact. There's a there's a, a little bit of a difference to make it run. It's obviously going to take energy and stuff to make this go. But you should know about gluconeogenesis. It basically, if this if your body does not have enough glucose because you know from your diet, you actually make glucose um, by doing a very similar reaction to glycolysis, but instead of breaking sugar apart to make pyruvate, you're actually building stuff to make sugars. And again, you need glucose specifically in your central nervous system and your neurons in your brain need, need glucose. So gluconeogenesis.